On 10th of November 2009, an ATI 7200 from Kingfisher Airlines landed at Mumbai Airport and skidded off the runway. Nobody was hurt, but the aircraft was damaged beyond repair. Hi, my name is Magnar Nordal. I am a captain and instructor on ATI 42 and 72. And this channel is all about aviation. Today, I will talk about an accident that happened in India some years ago. According to the report issued by the Air Safety Directorate in India, the accident occurred due to unstabilized approach and decision of the crew not to carry out the go-around. Yes, if you are not stabilized on final, you are mandated to go around. But there is more to the story than that. Like most accidents, this accident did not happen because of a single factor, but was a result of a chain of events that ultimately led to the outcome. In aviation, we have a concept called Threat and Error Management, TEM. This is a tool to identify threats that can affect the safety of flight. In this case, the threats were 1. Reduced landing distance 2. Dispatch error 3. The weather 4. Runway surface condition and 5. Inadequate communication from air traffic control. If you can remove just one of those factors, this accident could have been prevented. On the day of the accident, runway 14 and 32 was under maintenance and runway 09 and 27 had been shortened with a displaced threshold for runway 27. With a displaced threshold, runway 27 was designated 27A. The landing distance was reduced from about 2,800 meters down to 1,703 meters. Runway 27 has an ILS approach. Because the runway threshold was displaced, the ILS glide slope had been switched off, and the ILS localizer with DME was used for approach. And a revised procedure was published in NOTAM, Notice to Airmen. A day prior to the accident, the Chief Flight Inspector of the Flight Standard Directorate had instructed all scheduled operators about the conditions required to be followed for a safe operation of the flight. The instructions were 1. Only training captains can be utilized for flight. A training captain is a captain authorized to perform line training of other pilots. 2. The co-pilot should have minimum 300 hours of experience on the aircraft type. 3. Assisted takeoffs and landings were not permitted, which meant that the captain had to be pilot flying. 4. No operation shall take place when the runway is wet. However, this information was not published in NOTAM. Apparently, air traffic control was not informed either, because the runway was not closed when it was raining. Even the first officer did meet the requirement, the captain did not. He was not a training captain, therefore the company should not have scheduled this captain to fly at Mumbai that day. Published minima for approach was 2,400 meters. At the time of the accident, this meter was published. Mumbai Airport, at the 10th of the month, time 11. 10 UTC, also called Sulu, which corresponds with 1640 local time, the time of the accident. Wind from 70 degrees at 7 knots, visibility 2300 meters, light rain, few clouds at 1200 feet, scattered clouds at 1500 feet, few CB at 3000 feet, overcast at 9000 feet, temperature 24, dew point 22, and QNH 1003, and no significant change forecasted for the next two hours. Reported visibility was 100 meters below minima, but what matters is the visibility ATC reports before you cross final approach fix. Therefore, this was not an issue. It was raining, and there were patches of water on the runway. 
An Airbus 319 that landed ahead of the ATR experienced aquaplaning and reported it to the tower. Aquaplaning is a condition where the wheels are not in contact with the runway but floats on a cushion of water or steam. When the ATR landed, the tires locked up. The rubber began to melt and trapped water under the tire turned into steam. This is called reverted rubber aquaplaning. This picture is from the accident report but is dated seven months prior to the accident. It might be an archive photo or the date setting on the camera is not correct. But it clearly shows damage from reverted rubber aquaplaning. Reported wind was from east with 7 knots, that meant tailwind. However, this was within approved operational parameters. With 38 passengers on board, the aircraft would weigh between 18 and 19 tons depending on the fuel on board. If we assume that the weight was 19 tons, the landing distance on a wet runway will be 760 meters plus 14% for 7 knots tailwind. This equals 866 meters. When we calculate the landing distance on a runway contaminated by standing water, the landing distance is 860 meters plus 22% for the tailwind and this equals 1049 meters. The crew of the Airbus 319 that landed ahead of the ATR reported to the tower that they had experienced aquaplaning. However, the controller did not understand the meaning of the phrase aquaplaning and he did not forward this information to the crew of the ATR-72. Many accidents have happened because the aircraft has not been in a safe state before landing. To reduce the probability for such events from happening again, the aviation industry started to use a concept called stabilized approach. Flight Safety Foundation has set the following guidelines for stabilized approach. All flights must be stabilized by 1000 feet above airport elevation in instrument meteorological conditions IMC, and by 500 feet above airport elevation in visual meteorological conditions VMC. An approach is stabilized when all of the following criteria are met. 1. The aircraft is on the correct flight path. 2. Only small changes in heading pitch are required to maintain the correct flight path. 3. The aircraft speed is not more than VREF plus 20 knots, indicated airspeed and not less than VREF. VREF is the approach reference speed and is your uh, we approach plus eventual uh, wind correction. Some companies, they set the limit at plus 10 knots, other plus 15 knots. So that's up to the company to decide. Four, the aircraft is in correct landing configuration. Five, sink rate is no greater than 1000 feet per minute. If an approach requires a sink rate greater than 1000 feet per minute, that would be a steep approach. A special briefing should be conducted. Power setting is appropriate for aircraft configuration and is not below minimum power for approach as defined by the aircraft operating manual. On the ATR, it's between 20 and 25 percent, depending on the headwind or tailwind. All briefings and checklists have been conducted. Eight. Specific types of approaches are stabilized if they also fulfill the following. Instrument landing system, ILS, approaches must be flown within one dot of the glide slope and localizer. A category 2 or category 3 ILS approach must be flown within the expanded localizer band. During a circling approach, wings should be level on final when the aircraft reaches 300 feet above airport elevation. And Unique approach procedures or abnormal conditions requiring a deviation from the above elements of a stabilized approach require a special briefing. An approach that's become unstabilized below 1000 feet above airport elevation in IMC or below 500 feet above airport elevation in VMC requires an immediate go around. 
Before we continue, let's define the approach speed for this accident flight. We assume that the weight was 19 tons. In that case, the approach speed should be 101 knots. When you fly an approach in tailwind, it is very important not to fly too fast when you get close to the runway. The reason is that the wind velocity decreases when you descend through the last few feet above the runway. For example, if you fly at 100 knots and have 20 knots tailwind, then your ground speed is 120 knots. Let's assume that the wind on the ground is 10 knots. But because of the weight of the aircraft, it has inertia and is still traveling at 120 knots ground speed. Therefore, the indicated airspeed will now increase to 110 knots and it takes time to reduce it. As a result, your landing flare will be longer than you planned. And if you already fly too fast on final, your speed during the landing phase will be way too fast and you can throw your landing distance calculation straight out the window. Now, let's see how this crew flew the approach. The aircraft intercepted the lock glycer at 13 DME, that means 13 nautical miles from the DME antenna, and they had an altitude of 3,700 feet. At 9 DME, the aircraft was 220 feet above the profile. As the approach progressed, the aircraft became higher and higher above the published profile. When you look at this profile, the sand gradient is 350 feet per nautical mile. This is more than 3 degrees, which is 320 feet per nautical mile. When you are descending with 3 degrees, your rate of descent is 5 times the ground speed. So for example, when the ground speed is 140 knots, you must descend with 700 feet per minute to maintain 3 degrees. However, this approach was a bit steeper, so you should have added about 10% to your vertical descent rate. According to the report, the aircraft was established on the localizer at 3,700 feet and started to descend at 10 DME. This figure is from the report and shows the required and actual descent profiles from 9 DME. At that point, the aircraft was at 3,600 feet, which is 220 feet above the required profile. As the approach progressed, the aircraft became higher and higher above the profile. At 7 DME, the crew started to configure the aircraft. And here is one thing to remember. When the flaps move down, the lift increases, pushing the aircraft a couple of hundred feet above the profile. When you fly an ILS or a 3D RNAV approach, the autopilot will correct for this. But when you are descending with VS mode, vertical speed mode, you must compensate by increasing the rate of descent until you're back on the profile. When passing for DME, ATC advised the crew to check the altitude. At that point, they were 760 feet above the profile. The deviation increased until 3 DME where the aircraft was 900 feet above the profile. At this point, the crew had their fill in sight. At 2 DME, when passing 1800 feet, the captain disconnected the autopilot and initiated a steep descent with the power levers in idle. To increase the drag, the condition levers were set to 100% override. That's okay. At 1 DME, they were still 790 feet too high. When the radio altimeter showed 956 feet, the rate of descent was 3060 feet per minute and the nose was 10 degrees down. At 92 feet only, the descent rate was 1530 feet per minute and the indicated airspeed 129 knots. The ground proximity warning is a continuous warnings until touchdown. It sounds like this. At landing, the aircraft flared for 700 meters, which is 400 meters longer than normal, 
and it touched on with an indicated airspeed of 180 knots and a ground speed of 131 knots. The aircraft aqua planned and the crew was not able to stop. The aircraft exited the runway and stopped against a drainage canal. The aircraft was damaged beyond repair. However, the occupants escaped without injury. A lot went wrong here. First of all, the accident report indicates that the crew did not conduct a proper briefing before the approach. When you execute an approach that you have never flown before, you must be well prepared and that includes a very good briefing. Second, when executing a non-precision approach like this, it is the job of the pilot monitoring to read out distance and altitude as published in the procedure. Apparently, this did not happen and the captain was left alone with flying and navigation. It's evident that the captain had lost situation awareness. Third, when ATC asked about the altitude, the crew should have cross-checked the DME and altitude with the approach profile. Apparently, they did not. Four, when they got the runway in sight, they were way too high. And five, when passing 500 feet, they were not stabilized. They were too high and too fast, which means too much energy. The vertical descent rate was up to five times higher than normal. And the first officer should have called 500, not stabilized, go around. The lack of proper calls from the first officer was a contributing factor to this accident. Six, when a ground proximity warning is triggered, it's a serious warning. As you can see, the crew had several warnings indicated that they were not stabilized. And each warning should have resulted in a go-around. They might have landed safely if they did not have tailwind, or if the runway had been dry, or if the full length of the runway had been available. But aviation is not about giving away your margins. You fly a stabilized approach. In this case, there were just too many threats on the list. And not flying a stabilized approach was the nail in the coffin. Remember, when you are clear to land, you are also clear to go around. There's a mental trap here. When you are visual with the runway, most SOPs, standard operating procedures, tell you to call landing. That feels like a commitment. It would be better if the SOP tells you to call continue. Then it's easier to go around. In an airline company with a good safety culture, you are rewarded when you make a go around. And you are asked tough questions if you didn't do it. And this concludes this video. Please support the channel by clicking like, share, subscribe and hit the notification bell. More videos are in the making. Thank you for watching, have a wonderful day and happy landing.